I'm the chair of the Forums of Tolerance, uh, Lori Carlson. I would like you to introduce our MC for today, also his last forum on tolerance, because he's retiring, David Hall. Thank you, Lori, and welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce the president of North Shore Community College, Dr. Pat Gentilly. She is the fourth president of our college, and under her leadership, NSCC has been recognized by the U.S. Department of Education as one of the top 25 colleges in the country effectively serving low-income students and was ranked 23rd in the nation and at the top of the 15 Massachusetts community colleges for serving adult learners. President Gentilly is passionate about the community college mission and believes higher education is the major catalyst in lifting Americans out of poverty into self-sustaining careers and brighter futures for themselves and their communities. President Gentilly's commitment to student success and academic excellence are driven by her knowledge that a college degree remains the great leveler for individuals from diverse backgrounds. President Gentilly's fierce advocacy for equity, diversity, and tolerance is also evidenced by her previous work with Marion Wright Edelman. I don't think any relation to Julian Edelman, right? Okay. And the Children's Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. Uh, Chief Executive Officer of two large Girl Scout Councils and the Women's Humane Society in Pennsylvania. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Pat Gentilly. Well, let me say welcome to everybody. I'm really glad you're here. The Forum on Tolerance has been a tradition here at North Shore Community College. And what it does, especially for our students and our community members, is it allows you to explore sometimes quite provocative topics. But they're always timely topics. These are things where you need to understand the issue. And when you get the factual information about an issue and you can reflect on that and discuss it, then you can form an opinion about it. You know, forming an opinion without that work first is uh, one of the flaws I think we're seeing in our culture and in our country right now. So the Forum on Tolerance to me is an opportunity for you to explore thoroughly an issue, think about it, think about how it affects you and applies to you in your life, and then form your opinion about it. And hopefully once you form your opinion about it, you take some action. And so the Forum on Tolerance, I think, is an integral part of a learning community. So it's always, I'm always very grateful for what North Shore Community College has done over the years in allowing you to have this opportunity. And I'm always pleased to come and to welcome you to this learning opportunity and always looking forward to what the panelists are gonna say Yesterday, we up in the Danvers campus, we uh, watched a movie that was had me thinking all night and still this morning about the issues. So I'm glad you're here. Um, I recognize the faculty and the um, coordinators of this program. They put in a lot of work and they really care about the issue and they care about the opportunity for you to learn about that issue. They care about your uh, ability to constructively think about it, reflect on it, and then take action. So welcome to the forum, glad you're here. Thank you to the faculty and the others who work on this every year. Every semester we have one. Even when you graduate from North Shore Community College, we hope you come back for the forums on tolerance and continue to utilize this learning opportunity. So welcome and thank you.
And we're lucky to have with us today our first presenter, Mike Kiley. And I'm going to tell you a few things about Mike, all the great things he's done. He is the director of adoption centers for MSPCA Angel. I think many of us have heard of Angel uh, having to bring our pets there when you know they're under severe trauma or injury. Uh, and has been with the organization since 1994. And prior to this appointment, he acted as the director of the Noble Family Adoption Center up in Methuen. In his current role, he oversees the three main campuses in Boston, Cape Cod, and Methuen. Each of these locations operates an adoption center and low-cost public spay-neuter clinic. Additionally, the Methuen campus has one of Massachusetts' only equine and adoption centers, as well as the Hillside Acre Pet Cemetery and Pet Loss Services. Additionally, Mike oversees a number of programs for the MSPCA, including humane education, dog behavior, training, equine safety, ambulance training, and community outreach programs. Also, he's a busy guy. In addition to his work at the MSPCA, Mike has been serving as a board member of the New England Federation of Humane Societies for over a decade, for about 12 years, and has also been appointed as a trustee of the John T. and Jane A. Widerhold Foundation in 2017. So we welcome to the podium Mike Kiley. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me today. I figured I'd um, always like to start off a presentation with one of my daughters. This is Estelle, and she's demonstrating a great amount of tolerance, or the kitten is, I should say. So I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of sense of who I am, because I've been doing this for a long time. So I figured I'd give you a little historical photo references for when I first started when I was 16 as a volunteer, when I had hair. Uh, when I had a little less hair, but a little uh, more machismo. And then uh, everyone has to shave a mat off of a dog every once in a while and then wear it as hair at some point. <laughs> so just to give you a sense, I, um, I have a lot of fun doing the work that I do, and I hope that's reflected in this presentation as well. Uh, this is who I am now, you know, a, little, a lot less hair, a little uh, bigger than I used to be. So <laughs> I started in 1994 as a volunteer. Uh, and like Dave said, I started at Nevin's Farm, primarily in the director role, and uh, working now in our adoption centers and programs. Just to give you a little sense about the MSPCA, um, George Thorndike Angel in 1868 was a Boston lawyer, founded the MSPCA, and became the first president on March 23rd. And he read about an instance of cruelty in which two horses, each pulling two riders over 40 miles of rough roads, were raced to death. And that was the stimulus for the organization to be founded as a way to protect animals and to work on issues that were in our community. Now, what I do is I work as part of our MSPCA Animal Protection Division, which has three main components. We have a law enforcement division that investigates neglect and cruelty. Um, they are state police commissioned, and they uh, work throughout Massachusetts. There are six commissioned officers, which certainly is not enough for all of Massachusetts. But we work really hard uh, to help work on situations of neglect and um, abuse. We have an advocacy department that works on legislation to help protect animals uh, and have passed really incredible bills as of late, like the PAWS II Act, which is, um, and many other acts like breed specific legislation being outlawed and different things to help make sure that animals are protected within our communities. And then we have our adoption centers, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. So these are our three adoption centers uh, from left to right. Uh, the one on the left is the Boston Adoption Center, right, located right in Jamaica Plain, attached to our Angel Animal Medical Center. The middle one is Nevin's Farm, which has a large adoption center. It's our largest intake shelter for dogs and cats. It also hosts a equine and farm animal program as well, which is pretty unique in Massachusetts. So we take in nearly 1,000 animals a year, uh, horses, cows, pigs, goats. Um, it also is a, an area in which our law enforcement department, when they do have neglect or cruelty cases related to farm animals, is where those animals go. Um, this past year, we had the largest bust of a cockfighting ring out in Western Mass, where we received over 400 fighting cocks from one location. 
And then our Cape Adoption Center is the last one here. This actually just got rebuilt, so that opened in June of last year. Um, brand new state-of-the-art building, and now has a lot of opportunity for programs. Each of our adoption centers does contain a low-cost clinic for the public, so we do, uh, not in addition to adoptions, we also focus on um, public service for spay, neuter, and other medical programs. Just to tell you a little bit about some of the other programs by the numbers, um, this is our last year's stats. So we placed 6,442 animals into new homes that came to us um, and needing to be surrendered or as strays. We have uh, 1,458 volunteers that logged in over 81,000 hours of service, which is amazing. Uh, we run training classes for the public, and uh, we had over 3,000 people attending training classes with their animals. Humane Education, which is one of the most important programs that we run. We had um, nearly 3,000 children that participated in various programs, ranging from toddlers um, all the way through high school. Um, we also offer um, training programs for equine and large animal rescue. We had over 600 people trained, and those are usually first responders like the fire department, police department, things along those lines. And um, what I'll talk more about today is a little bit about what we do with the public and how this relates to tolerance. Um, we helped vaccinate over 1,300 animals and spay over 6,000 animals. So everybody certainly, I think, knows adoption centers focus on helping to take in animals that no longer have homes and then rehome them into new places. That's certainly what most of our history has been like for the past four decades or so, really focused on overpopulation in our communities helping to find homes for new animals. Um, but what I want to point out with some of these slides is that we're seeing an incredible decrease in the number of homeless animals in Massachusetts, which is fantastic. And that's largely related to our increase in low cost um, or free spay neuter services to the public. So the more services that we offer for spay neuter, the, the less homeless animals in our community, which is fantastic. Uh, cats has been really the biggest concern for us over the past two decades, and you can see that the, there's a precipitous drop um, in intake for homeless cats, and that is very directly related to our, our programs that we offer for spay neuter for cats. Uh, and homeless dogs is a little bit, uh, not quite as linear as the other one, and not quite as, as, as obvious that it's spay neuter is helping, but it is certainly a major function. Um, and I think it's important to note this because I think for a long time people had the impression that uh, people surrendering animals or stray animals was a result of people not caring or not willing to do the work that they um, needed to help combat the overpopulation issue. But I think what we're gonna recognize as we go through this presentation that it was really more about an access to affordable resources and not about people caring or not caring about animals. Uh, by the way, this is our placement rate for animals, so we have a very strong adoption rate. We're an open admission style shelter, which means we never refuse an animal that needs to come to us regardless of their um, age or health or breed uh, or temperament, and we take them in no matter what, so we always want to make sure that there's a safety net in place if animals are at risk. So in 2017, our Animal Protection Division really decided that um, we recognized that it, Maybe we were past the point in which overpopulation was the main thing that we needed to focus on, and that uh, the numbers of animals coming into our adoption centers each year was, was getting lower and lower, and that that was maybe an opportunity for us to redefine who we were, were who we were and what we wanted to do. Um, and I think the re recognition on our part was that we were so focused on taking animals in and trying to reduce euthanasia and increase adoptions um, that we weren't really working at the root of the issue, and that we weren't really addressing the needs within our community. So we went through a strategic plan, and we um, decided that this, we came up with this statement, the Animal Protection Division will, become, will be increasingly proactive by addressing the underlying issues that put animals at risk. We will deepen our connections to communities and organizations and serve as a valuable resource to protect the largest number of animals possible. So I'll tell you a little bit how we're doing that. And that's really through our outreach programs. And probably the way that we would rewrite a little bit of that strategic plan is to really focus on the fact that um, although we are, are, are attack, taxed with helping animals, we really are a people organization. We are, really are uh, not able to do anything if it isn't about working with people. Working directly with animals is fantastic. It's really a um, rewarding job, but we, don't change anything if we don't work at the hearts and minds of people and we don't work directly with our community to try to address the needs of, of the people and the animals that they live with. 
Um, and our main components are working on outreach programs and focusing on people living in poverty that have animals and how we may be able to um, provide resources that help keep people and pets together. Uh, I think the recognition that we had and maybe the misunderstanding that we had in the past was that I, I think we misunderstood that we believed that people didn't care about their animals if they weren't providing veterinary care or spay neuter or that they may be struggling to do a procedure that was really expensive. But the recognition is that people need animals. They, they enrich our lives. They deepen our connections um, and they provide that companionship and that it was our duty to make sure that people had that opportunity and not taken away because of income. So we increased access to care by offering free or low cost resources um, and building trust and becoming part of the community. And really, I think working within the community to make sure we understood what the needs were and that we were um, finding out directly what, what was needed and addressing those needs. So we uh, focused on two areas, uh, Dorchester with our Pets for Life program, which is part of uh, HSUS, you'll hear from Stephanie, I'm sure a little bit about that uh, in a little bit, and our Lowell Partnership for Pets. Uh, these are grant funded and they are targeted based on a community assessment that focuses on um, identifying poverty areas first and foremost, but also uh, within those areas that are dealing with poverty, not having access to any animal resources at an affordable rate. So to give you a sense of the, um, the initiative for Lowell, this was actually started in 2012. Uh, we, uh, Lowell was dealing with a whole number of uh, issues related to safety around dogs. It was primarily focused on pit bulls and that the city was struggling with the number of pit bull attacks that they were having and looking to find a way to um, legislate that. They were looking to do um, you know, a, a pit bull ban within the city and to try to work on the issue from that. They also um, worked on, in, uh, on strengthening ways to punish people who are not doing responsible care. Um, in 2017, uh, you guys probably heard this, a child was killed by two pit bulls in the city of Lowell and it brought that issue right back up. And we um, got together again and we created an animal task force and that was a number of people, the MSPCA, Lowell Humane Society, Animal Control, City Council, to address the issue because it came right back to the surface that um, the community started focusing on pit bulls and trying to deal with the pit bull issue. And we sat around and said, look, we've been working on this issue since 2012. We have been continuing to find ways in which we were going to punish people who, whose animals attacked people or who weren't licensed or letting their animals run loose. But the bottom line is that everything that came from a legislative standpoint was a reactive standpoint. In all the situations, something bad had to happen first in order for, um, for those regulations to take place. So we, you know, having a child get killed in your community was a sobering experience for all of us. And we said, maybe we need to try to find a different way. Maybe it's not about how we punish people um, that have these issues, but how we might be able to proactively identify the resources that they need to be able to um, have that animal in a way that uh, reduces issues related to safety with dogs and to make sure that they had the resources necessary to provide um, appropriate care for the animal. So we launched our program for that, and it's um, focused on outreach. We focused on the two communities, the two neighborhoods in Lowell that were dealing with the largest amount of poverty, and they were dealing with 45 and 35% poverty rates in the uh, neighborhoods of the Acre and Back Central, uh, which is uh, comparatively to the rest of Lowell, Lowell overall is 25%. So they were dealing with significant poverty-related issues. And we looked at ways in which we could connect in with human services to be able to identify the needs that were there um, and provide services directly to the people in those communities. Um, so we offer free or low cost spay neuter for uh, people living in that community, $10 wellness visits, subsidized emergency and medical care, food, distrib uh, food distribution through human food pantries, free behavior consultations, which was really important in this one. We were focused on identifying areas of aggression or risky animal behavior, dog behavior, and trying to get people the resources they need to be, uh, to be able to make sure that, that something bad didn't happen with their animal when they were dealing with those issues. Free uh, transportation to appointments and free pet care and information resources and supplies. Uh, our food donations, starting in January, we offered, um, we were able to donate almost 5,000 meals, um, 1,600 pounds of litter, 
and 168 pounds of treats since January 1st, and we're continuing to uh, distribute out those food to um, various pantries to make sure that the animals that are um, living in poverty with people that they're able to get both human food as well as pet food. We also started a um, free vac uh, community vaccine clinic uh, as an event a few weeks ago. We had 316 animals that attended and 107 animals signed up for spay neuter. What was really important for us for this clinic is to recognize that many people who came to this clinic, their animals had never seen a veterinarian. They had um, wanted to see a veterinarian but could not afford it. And so be able to, being able to provide vaccines and microchips for free was an important service and people came out in, in large numbers for that. Um, and that was a collaboration effort between our angel um, hospitals as well as uh, our adoption centers are in a law enforcement department. Uh, Lowell Humane Society, Lowell Animal Control, and Lowell Veterinary Community also responded to help with that as well. What I love about these clinics is it gives us an opportunity to meet people in the community and identify what their needs are and interact with them in a way that um, uh, is extremely positive and starts to build an incredible relationship. Our Dorchester Pets for Life program is similar provision of resources, free spay neuter, medical care, uh, food and supplies, transportation, behavior care information, and it's been running since January. We focus on the zip code of 02121 because that's certainly an area that is uh, dealing with significant poverty, but also within that zip code there are no areas in which people can get uh, pet supplies at all, not even a supermarket for pet food. So we've helped, um, this is our really a kind of a door-to-door -door service that we offer. So we knock on people's doors, just say, we're here to help you with your animals if you need any assistance. And we've uh, helped 752 animals and 613 clients. 87% um, of those clients have never used our services before, even when they were offered at a low cost. And 50% never have seen a veterinarian with their animal. 72% um, of those animals started as intact, and we um, have helped, uh, we have an 86% uh, completion rate for spay neuter services in that community. Uh, so these are just some of the pictures of people we've met, and one of the things that I think is great about this is that we are just building relationships and identifying, um, yeah, just working with people in the community to help animals and make sure that they have the support that they need. Um, and I wanted to give you a couple of stories that kind of highlight how our community outreach does help from a, from a real standpoint. So Lee um, is a person who we met in the city of Lawrence where we're actually gonna be starting our next community outreach. And um, this is a person who is somebody we've known for over two decades. She's a cat lover. She had eight cats in her apartment living alone. Uh, but she was dealing with um, uh, age-related issues that she wasn't able to really continue to provide the care. Um, her memory started to slip a little bit. And she was living alone and wanting to live alone, but struggling to make sure that her animals had what they needed. Um, her veterinarian called us and said, look, Lee is a wonderful person. She cares deeply about her cats, but she's a bit over her head. Um, she doesn't have a way to drive to us when she needs help. We want to provide veterinary services to her cats, but we need someone to help her directly. So we sent our community outreach person over and made a connection with Lee and started to build a relationship through helping to transport those cats to the veterinarian. Um, some of them were older and dealing with significant medical issues. Um, but what we started to notice is that Lee had uh, some bigger issues. You know, she was, her house was, her apartment was not very clean. Um, she wasn't necessarily shopping very well for herself, and she wasn't really advocating for herself the way that she needed to. Um, and through building that relationship and that trust through helping her get her cats to the veterinarian and get them the, the care that they needed and offering her supplies like food and litter, um, we started to build a relationship that was beyond just the cats, we started to be able to talk with her about what services she might need to be able to help better care for herself because, uh, and connecting with her through the cats saying, you know, look, if you take better care of yourself and your apartment, your cats will be happier and healthier. Um, and we started to build that, that deeper connection with her. Our community outreach coordinator helped to make sure that she got services through elder services for cleaning her apartment. They went over and cleaned out all of the issues that she had and she has a cleaning service coming to her regularly. Um, she has services for food support as well. And ultimately, you know, she's gone from a situation that was a pretty bad 
um, pretty bad situation, both for her cats as well as for herself, to a point where she's proactively reaching out to us. She's getting the services she needs for herself, and as a result, she's also getting the services that she needs for her cats. This is a person who, um, uh, who is a representative of a lot of people that we meet dealing with elder-related issues, and we're able to help her um, have her independence and make sure that she is uh, taking care of everything well, but we're also going to be in a relationship with her for probably many years to come. We'll drop by her house monthly, make sure that she has supplies, check in on her. Um, and these are some of the the pictures. They're not as quite as dramatic as I'd like, but they um, <laughs> or not as clean as you should say is easy to see. But you can see um, with these that she's, you know, her floors were covered in dirt. Um, sometimes urine or feces from the cats and the cleaning service got her back to the point where she had a much more livable condition, um, better for her, and again, better for the cats. And the other one is a, you know, a situation that we see often in which someone has a, a situation where their animal gets injured, but they can't afford the resources to care for the animal, but they care deeply about their animal, and they're faced with really difficult situations, um, trying to find a way to come up with thousands of dollars to do a significant medical procedure, euthanizing their animal if they can't, um, and many people just really feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. So this is a person, um, her dog is named Ch uh, Che Che, and her name is Natasha. Her dog suffered a back injury, a spinal cord injury. Um, it was pretty significant. She went to our Angel Animal Medical Center. She already was in debt. Um, she had no way to be able to provide the, the medical resources. Um, the veterinary team said there's a possibility that this could heal on its own with a brace, and um, you know, surgery would be best, but brace might work. And so she, she opted for that because she couldn't imagine being without her pet. Um, it was such an important animal to her and her family. Um, but unfortunately, she missed her follow-up appointment and there were some concerns that Che Che may be in a state of suffering in her apartment. So our law enforcement department got a call to say, could you please check in and see if she's, um, you know, if the animal is okay. So, um, we happen to be in Dorchester where we have community outreach. So we sent one of our veterinarians that helps with community outreach out with our law enforcement agent. The medical records made us very worried that the animal was probably not able to move and suffering. Um, we had been there once before through law enforcement and the gentleman that answered the door refused us to enter, didn't want us to be there. So that raised a lot of red flags. But Natasha sent a text message to our law enforcement agent um, prior to a visit that was arranged and said, listen, I, um, I don't, I'm not sure what to do. I love my animal. This is an important part of our, our family, but I cannot afford these resources. Please don't take my animal from me. Um, we're good people, but we just don't have the money to be able to care for this animal. Um, and I think that was an important thing for us to hear is that this animal meant everything to them and losing this animal over financial resources was something that we had hoped that we didn't have to have happen. So we got there. Uh, luckily, the dog was actually doing fairly well, but needed to have continued brace changes uh, under anesthesia. And we recognized that there was an opportunity to help here. So um, our veterinary team ha will see through uh, having the animal come to our clinic, changing the back brace for the next six weeks, providing her with resources for um, food support and other support while she goes through this this challenge, um, and we've gotten to a point where uh, this animal will have a great outcome and be able to stay with its family and not have to be separated. So I think it's just an important part to recognize that there are um, people who may be living, with, uh, living in poverty and may not have resources that other people do, but uh, we are shifting our mission to a point where we're trying to help people keep their animals in their homes and help keep that human-animal bond strong. Uh, so I think, you know, it's a different approach for us and something that maybe we had different opinions on the community that we were working in prior, but working directly with people one-on-one -on -one and addressing their needs is something that we are inspired to continue to keep doing. So that's sort of the overview of our programs. I don't know if anyone has questions or if we're saving those to the end. All right, great. So first, Mike, uh, you could stay up here. I just wanted to say what a great example that was of a presentation that really looks at that connection 
between animal rights and human rights. And so definitely would love to take some questions from Mike if anybody has some. And Laurie, I don't know if we can get anybody to help with the mics or... Yes. To some degree, yes. I think one of the, um, kind of along with that, what we're recognizing right now is that there's a rising cost in veterinary services. So um, veterinarians are talking about this and recognizing that the exponential rate of increase of veterinary services is a challenge for people who might even be, you know, not be living in poverty at all, and that being able to provide those services is becoming even more challenging. Um, you know, I think for me, one of the things that I recognized throughout this process is that um, the, what it really means to live in poverty is something that I'll probably never fully understand because I, I don't currently live in poverty and I've not had that experience. Um, but I have met a number of people who, even when we offer programs that are $10 spay neuter programs for cats, is that being able to come up with $10 for their animal is a hardship for them. I had a person who showed up for a, um, you know, didn't show up for an appointment for a $10 cat spay neuter and when I called to say, you know, uh, do you need to reschedule or is something that happened and it was, I didn't have the $10 so I didn't show up and we invited her in for free. Um, and I think just the, I think that there's a number of factors when it comes down to, you know, what people really are taking in for income, paying for the bills for their family um, and what people have left over for, uh, to be able to care for their animals is just an incredible challenge when you're dealing with extreme poverty related issues. So um, I think the recession certainly has something to do with it, but I think people living in poverty is uh, in chronic poverty, that recession is only a small component for them. Um, and I think finding resources to be able to help people is gonna be a challenge that we need to come up with, especially when it comes to increased costs for veterinary care. Yes. I think there's a number of reasons for that. Poverty is certainly part of it. I think uh, there's also there's also climate-related issues. Um, so New England has typically had the lowest population of homeless animals, or has been lower and lower than the rest of the nation. So we we're kind of in a better position, which is why so many animals are imported from the south to the northeast area. But one of the things that we have that's different than, say, a southern state is we have winter. And so um, stray populations outside naturally are going to be limited by harsh winters. And that's really sad, but um, when you're thinking about, um, you know, Louisiana and sort of deep, deep southern states, there is no winter conditions. So those stray populations continue to get larger and larger and larger, coupled with poverty, um, so that you have kind of an issue where people are not um, having affordable resources for their own animals for, and being able to afford spay neuter, coupled with a really high stray population that's, uh, that's not being kind of controlled naturally by weather. So I think that's where the overpopulation starts to get to an exponential number. And it is much more significant. Um, you know, the numbers that I showed you, um, you know, at the height when I started, it was 10,000 animals coming into our individual shelters and probably somewhere in the 25 to 30,000 animals being surrendered per year. There are individual shelters in southern states that are dealing with 100 to 150,000 animals coming into their adoption centers. So the scale is just so much more significant. And on that note, we, you know, we really looked at whether um, we should start to import animals for adoption and start to bring animals from the south. But um, one of the reasons why we didn't do that is because so many other adoption centers were already doing that, that we felt like there was a gap in what was happening in our communities. So we focused our energies towards making sure that animals that were still at risk in our communities um, were being, those needs were being addressed first. You and then, you. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, is there anything that, that you are doing or the, that the public can do to kind of um, 
talk back against, I guess I'll call it the puppy factories. Mm -hmm. um, we still, you know, there's the, the slogan we hear a lot is adopt, don't shop. Right. You know? And so basically you can find whatever breed you want through rescue or through the MSPCA. Has that problem of, of puppy mills or unscrupulous breeders uh, been getting worse or better in, in your experience? Stephanie's going to really want to take this one, I think, but the, uh, where I think HSUS really works on puppy mills the most. I will say that one of the challenges that we're currently dealing with is as the population of animals being surrendered to our shelters drops, is that the idea of adopt, don't shop gets harder and harder because um, we don't necessarily have as many puppies and kittens or highly adoptable animals as we used to when our overpopulation issues were higher. So it's sort of a good and bad thing. Obviously, it's good to not have as many homeless animals, but if you're looking for an animal and you want to adopt, it's a little bit more challenging now than it was before. Um, I do think it's really challenging for people to know the source of their animal, where they're getting them, and I think there's going to be need to be conversations about how to responsibly source animals um, if you don't find the animal that you're looking for at an adoption center. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but no, it'll come up in your other. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I think she, uh, she was up first, and then I'll grab you. Sorry. Um, are your facilities welcoming to No, we're not limited to geographic areas. And in fact, our Methuen location is on the border of New Hampshire. Um, so we take animals, 16% of the animals coming into our Methuen location are from New Hampshire. Um, and we certainly see them from other states, but all throughout Massachusetts for sure. Sorry, you had a question, sir. Yes, uh, my question was related to uh, your recognition of, of changing your focus to actually working with uh, uh, people and their animals and not assuming that you know they're doing something wrong. I'm just, I, I, I thought that was a really important aha moment that you stressed. I'm just wondering, are you seeing that as becoming more of a trend nationally or do you see sort of the old model still dominating? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's becoming a, um, more recognize that our duty is to start working in a different way and that sheltering animals is not really the priority. And in fact, if we didn't deal with an overpopulation issue, we wouldn't have been focused on uh, shelters for so long. And because we've been doing it for four decades, it's become our identity. And when I look back at, you know, sort of how the MSPCA formed with um, George Angel uh, taking action on animals being raced to death and having a direct response to that. Um, I think how we can reinvent ourselves and start thinking about working at roots of issues to help people keep their animals and help people care for their animals in the way that they want to, but may uh, struggle to afford it. And I think one of the things that we're, we're seeing is that um, that change is really integral. We have a law enforcement department, like I mentioned, and law enforcement is sort of like that last safety net. When someone um, isn't caring for their animal the right way, our law enforcement department is there to protect the animal and focus on that. But I will say that most of the times our law enforcement department has been dealing with people who are struggling with the way that they care with their animals. It's a relatively small percentage of people who are actively abusing and neglecting their animals on purpose and that it's more of a function of resource allocation. And I think what we're seeing is that um, taking it from a punitive standpoint is really not the best approach, that we want to be able to get out ahead of that start to um, identify the symptoms of, um, of situations where people, resources may be causing the issue as opposed to the person's actions, and think about how we may be able to layer in another safety net with community outreach to help people before they get to a point where it becomes punitive. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, 20, there's, there's not really a, like a gold standard for how old you have to be to adopt. Um, our organization doesn't put a specific component on that. What we really focus on is the matchmaking component, making sure that it's a good match for the person and the animal. And um, what we tend to look at is if you're the head of household and if you can make that decision. So if you rent an apartment and you're 18, um, that's, you're the head of the household. That's who, you know, you can make those decisions if you're, you know, 18 and living with your parents, we want to make sure that the parents are involved because they're the ones that are ultimately responsible. So um, every 
town has a different sort of uh, legal ownership age, but most of the time that's around 18. So um, some organizations will put age limits um, that they determine is where they want to be from an individual organization, but uh, from a statute standpoint, you know, typically that's around 18. So go get some animals. So <laughs> Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Wonderful presentation. Our next presenter is Stephanie Harris. And Stephanie is the Massachusetts and Rhode Island State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. And under this uh, position, Stephanie works to advance local, state, and federal legislative priorities, building coalitions and expanding a humane network in each state, uh, developing localized strategies to implement national campaigns, promote emergency and disaster preparedness, represent uh, the Humane Society of the United States in local and state media, and she maintains relationships with state agencies and public officials, and facilitates enforcement of animal protection laws, and a whole lot more, too, I'm sure. And the uh, interesting thing about Stephanie, I'm looking at this list here, she's been involved in passing a number of um, animal protection laws, and some of those I'm sure she's going to talk more about are Pause 2, the cost of animal care, uh, prevent animal, uh, farm animal cruelty, and also hut cars, tethering, and enhanced enforcement. Those are some of the, the legislative pieces. Um, she has served as the campaign director for the coalition responsible for passing the 2016 ballot campaign. Some people may remember that to prohibit cruel confinement of farm animals, which passed with a 78% voter support the largest margin of any animal protection ballot measure in American history. That deserves a little woo-hoo. Absolutely. This historic law, an act to prevent uh, farm animal cruelty, will phase out the sale of eggs, veal, and pork from animals who were locked in cramped cages. Very important. Uh, she has worked with uh, HU, HSUS since tw 2012 and has also worked on uh, wildlife protection ballot campaigns in both Michigan and Maine, and on farm animal protection public policy while she was based out of the HSUS headquarters outside of Washington, DC. Now, prior to her work in animal advocacy, Stephanie worked in program management at a wildlife rehabilitation clinic, and she has studied political science and studio art at Franklin and Marshall College. So we welcome Stephanie to the podium. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm just gonna close this. I don't have any slides. Just, not that it's not a lovely photo. Um, well, maybe it'll stay up. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I'm glad to be here today. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Stephanie Harris, and I'm the Massachusetts and Rhode Island State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. I've been working with the organization for a number of years now in several different capacities, as you heard. Um, and I am grateful to be here talking um, about how this work relates to this issue of tolerance. And so like every good millennial, when I was asked to speak at this conference, the first thing I did was Google the word tolerance. Um, and so as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, but maybe hasn't thought explicitly about tolerance, means to allow or accept, accept the existence of opinions or behaviors that one does not necessarily agree with. And then an alternative definition is the capacity to endure continued subjection to something, a drug, a transplant, an antigen, um, environmental conditions. Uh, so that ability to, to tolerate something. Um, and I think that usually when I think of my work, except for, um, or I guess especially in the case of some of the, what Mike was talking about, about this, the Pets for Life issue, um, usually I think of my work largely in terms of compassion. 
And so I was interested in thinking about how these two things intersect. How does compassion intersect with, intersect with tolerance? And then also, of course, how do, how do these human and social issues intersect with these animal-specific issues? So those were the things that I was stewing on in preparation for this talk. And one of the issues that we run into is that when compassion is extended beyond victims to the perpetrator, um, then it can be assumed that there is some uh, implied tolerance of that uh, inhumane treatment or that unacceptable behavior, a sort of condoning of those actions. Um, and I think that I would challenge everyone to um, reconceptualize the word tolerance so that that's not how we see it. Um, and, that, and that when you frame it in the, with the lens of compassion, then that is deserved by both the victim and the, the perpetrator. Um, and respecting someone's views and respecting someone who holds certain views um, doesn't mean that you have to personally agree with them. But you can still be compassionate and you can still be tolerant. And so demonstrating this compassion without adopting those belief, beliefs is very important. And so to speak a little bit about the Humane Society of the United States, we are the nation's largest animal protection organization. Um, we operate across the United States, but also we have an international branch, Humane Society International. So we have a presence on, in um, a number of countries all around the world. Uh, my focus is on the states specifically, and of course, Massachusetts and Rhode Island even more uh, narrowly. So the Humane Society of the United States, our mission is to fight for animals. And we were founded to confront cruelty and to address some of these systematic abuses of animals. And so we work very closely with shelter and rescue partners, other organizations in the animal welfare or protection movement. And then well beyond that, we partner with folks all across all different spectrums. Um, and the way that we think of ourselves is an organization that was formed to, to confront cruelty and to fill the gap. There are so many folks that are providing hands-on care to animals, and that work is so vitally important. I did some of that myself when I worked in wildlife rescue and rehabilitation, but one of the things that I noticed doing that work was that I didn't feel like um, I could make enough of a difference. I felt like I was it was so important what I was doing, and I was impacting so many animals, but I wanted to find a way to help even more, to help prevent animals from coming through the doors in the first place. And that's one of the things that HSUS tries to do, is try to um, prevent animals from being in the situations where they need that hands-on care in the first place. And there are so many shelters um, across the country that are getting, especially in recent years, more and more involved in that work through programs like Pets for Life, which um, you've heard MSPCA is engaged on. But there are other um, animal shelters here in Massachusetts and, and well beyond that are doing that kind of work as well. So helping. Um, fill these, these unfilled gaps. So because HSUS's scope is so large, we fight for all animals, and we really do have campaigns that address all different animal issues. So whether that's companion animals, your cats and dogs and your small animals, um, whether that's uh, wildlife, marine mammals, uh, native carnivores, um, you sort of you name it and we work on it. Um, wildlife farm animals, um, animals in research. We have different campaign teams at our headquarters that are focused to work on each of these different categories of animals. And so then as the state director, my role is really to, um, well, they're the issue experts. They're the experts on a, a given um, category of animals or specific species. Um, my role as state director is to be the expert in Massachusetts and specifically um, the Massachusetts political landscape. So that's where I spend a lot of my time is at the Massachusetts as well as Rhode Island. I added that to my plate just this last summer, so it's uh, newer to me, but I spent a lot of my time in those two state houses um, to help uh, pass uh, tr transformative um, laws for animals, because that's really what is needed today. And because we work on all these different issues, because we're not a single issue organization, um, it's important for us to be a big tent. It's important for us to meet people where they are and welcome them to this organization, this animal protection movement, and to help move them in the, in the, in the direction of compassion. Um, and 
So that means working with people with whom I very often don't agree. It means working with people, sometimes I actively, vehemently oppose on certain issues, but when there is overlap, it means coming together and and finding, um, finding those commonalities for the greater good. And so, uh, much of my work is um, with the state legislature. So since we're in Massachusetts today, I thought I would just give like a quick Lobby 101, just a quick little summary of how the Massachusetts state legislature works, because that is one of our best vehicles for driving this change for animals. Um, it's important to be driving change at the local level, at the municipal level, but also at the state level and the federal level. And primarily where I work is at the state level, although I do assist with efforts at the federal and local level as well. So. Um, our state legislature here in Massachusetts, uh, is a, it's, we have a two-year session, two-year legislative session. So it begins in an odd year and ends in January of an odd year and ends in December of an even year, which means that our legislature, unlike a lot of other states, is always in session. So it means that there's always things that are happening. There are always opportunities to engage. There are some states that are in session maybe three months, 45 days, every other year. So it's very different in Massachusetts how accessible our legislators are. Um, They're full-time legislators, so this is their full-time job. So they are very accessible to all of us as uh, as voters, as citizens, as residents. Um, And so I would encourage all of you to reach out to them. So our state legislature, like I said, it's a two-year session. There are an average of five to 6,000 bills filed, of which maybe 100 or so relate to animals. And then of those, maybe 15 or 20 uh, HSUS I would comment on. And then of those, maybe five or six are our top priorities. And every single bill in Massachusetts of those five or 6,000, every single one that's filed in a timely manner, so the filing period is the beginning of that two-year session, uh, is guaranteed a public hearing. So what that means is that every single one of you and every single person in the state of Massachusetts, and frankly beyond, is welcome to come to the state house when one of those bills has a hearing and speak. You're guaranteed three minutes in front of a committee of state legislators. And so that may include your personal legislator based on where you live, um, or it may not, but you have this additional audience of folks whose minds you have the opportunity to change. And so I know it's a big pain to get to downtown Boston and speak at the State House, but you are guaranteed that right to have three minutes in front of the, this committee. And those committees are the first major hurdle in getting a bill passed. So it makes a really big difference. If a bill isn't released from that committee with a favorable report, it's pretty much dead in the water. So those three minutes that all of you have can make a really big difference. And even if you can't get to the State House, you can still submit your emails to the committee as well as to your personal legislators from afar. And so everyone has one state senator and one state representative. And so one thing, I know usually when folks are giving presentations, what they want is for people to put their phones away. Silence your phones, turn them off, put your phones in your pocket. But I actually want everyone in the room to just pull out your phone really quick. And ignore that text message if you can manage, uh, but pull out your phones for those of you who have them, or if you have a notebook, if you don't have a phone with you, um, and type into, into the browser search malegislature.gov. So that's M-A-L-E-G-I-S-L-A-T-U-R-E.gov, malegislature.gov. And that is a phenomenal resource because once you enter your address, the place that you live in Massachusetts, once you enter that into that website, you will get the contact information for your legislators, your state and federal legislators. And that is a phenomenal access point. So one of the first things I encourage folks to do is to save those, that information for those legislators as a contact in your phone. I want you to get to the point where you've got them pretty much on speed dial. But so the first step would be to look them up and then put those names in your contact. I'll give everybody a minute to do that. Developing relationships with your legislators so that they think of you when they think of a specific issue 
um, makes a huge difference. You'll hear different advocacy organizations talk about the most effective way to contact a legislator. And is it Facebook? Is it Twitter? Is it in person? Is it email? Is it by phone? If it's if it's an email, is it a hand? Is it a, um, a customized email versus a form email? Is it a handwritten letter? Is it a, hand, a note card? What is the best way to contact your legislator? And what I see is that once you have started a, some relationship with those legislators, once you've made that initial contact, and especially if that contact can be in person or by phone, that initial contact, but they get to know you. And so then your subsequent follow-up by email, by text, on Facebook, at that point they know your name, they recognize your name at least, and they start to think of you as a go-to person. And if you become a go-to person for them on a specific set of issues, they'll even proactively reach out to you and say, well, you know, as a constituent, as somebody who lives in my district, as somebody that I want to vote for me in the next election, what do you think about this issue? And it's easy for politics to become really remote from us um, and to feel like a big scary thing and getting down to the Boston, Boston State House. Um, but these, these people are beholden to you. And so I would really challenge everyone here to not only save that contact info in your contacts, in your phone, but also to start making use of it. Start following your legislators on Facebook. You can start commenting on things. Pick up the phone and call. All of our legislators in Massachusetts has, have staff and they have voicemails. So if you're nervous about talking to your legislator, um, know that first, probably a staff person's gonna pick up. Um, so maybe that makes it a little bit less intimidating, but also, you can call in the evening and leave a voicemail for them and they'll listen to it in the morning and they'll still get your name down and still be counted as a phone call. Sometimes on issues, they'll tally how many calls they get in favor or you know, in opposition to a certain issue. So this really makes a difference. So I just wanna really highlight that point. So after a bill uh, hopefully makes it out of a committee, um, that, that initial joint committee, which is an issue-specific committee. So an example for animal protection issues, those bills often will go to an environment committee, um, a municipalities committee. Um, those are the most common ones, but they go into an, this issue-specific committee with legislators that have been, that have specifically requested to sit on that committee and hear those types of bills or that have been assigned to it. And so they become familiar with these issues generally. Uh, and so once that bill, hopefully, gets released from that committee, um, it moves through the rest of the legislative process, but that's that first big hurdle. So then the rest of the process includes going through one more committee um, based on the chamber that the bill came from, so whether it was from a House or the Senate, so whether whether a representative filed it or a state senator filed it. Um, and then it moves through that full body, that full chamber. So either the full House of Representatives or the full Senate. And those that means every single one of your legislators would have the opportunity to vote, whether that's, that's moving through the House or the Senate. And then it flips. It goes to the other chamber. And because our initial committee is um, our joint, so those f first hurdle that the bill goes through, it includes both representatives and senators. Um, it doesn't have to go back to an issue-specific committee. So it flips and goes to the other chamber. And then assuming it passes in that chamber as well, it moves on to the governor's desk. So these bills, the process can get really confusing and there's a lot of minutia and I'm happy to talk with anybody through more of the detailed steps of it, but that's the gist of how it passes, how a bill can pass in Massachusetts. It takes on average three legislative sessions for an animal protection measure to pass in Massachusetts. So I said we have a two-year legislative session. So that means an average of six years for an animal protection bill to pass. It's not always the case. Sometimes they'll pass on their first chance. But usually, legislators become familiar with an issue over time, and there's room for compromise. And that's one of the things I think about when I think about compassion and I think about tolerance is um, the opportunities for compromise, the opportunities for stakeholder input, and um, building a strong coalition. And that means bringing on board not just your friends, not just people for whom their mission is obviously aligned, but it means bringing on unlikely allies. Um, and one of the ways to, um, to, to think about that is um, Say we're working on an issue, um, one of the bills we are working on right now is to prevent illegal hunting activity, prevent illegal hunting and fishing, prevent poaching in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has some of the lowest penalties for poaching in the country. Some of them are outdated by about a century. We're also one of only two states that aren't a member of the Interstate Wildlife Violator Compact. So that's a compact that allows for reciprocity across state lines. So it works like a driver's license compact. If somebody is um, convicted of 
drunk driving in New Hampshire, should they come to Massachusetts and be able to get a driver's license? Well, similarly, if somebody has lost their hunting and fishing privileges in another state, or maybe 49 other states, should they still be able to come to Massachusetts and get a hunting or fishing license? Well, because we're not a member of the compact, uh, not only can they do that, but our law enforcement agency and Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, they actually have no way of knowing that those privileges have been lost because membership in this compact gets you access to this database of wildlife violators. That's people who've been convicted of illegal hunting and fishing. So this is obviously an animal welfare issue, right? But this is also an issue for sportsmen and women. And sometimes those sportsmen and women and, and HSUS and the animal welfare movement, we vehemently disagree on certain issues. In 1996, there was a Wildlife Protection Act that was passed at the ballot, um, and that established a lot of protections for wildlife, including the prohibition on body gripping traps in most circumstances. And that is something that, um, that some members of the sportsman community have been trying to change, trying to repeal parts of that. Um, every single session since 1996, there have been efforts to do that. So there's a lot of disagreement there. Um, we certainly don't want that to happen, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't work together to establish these other protections where we do align, where there is this overlap. And so that takes tolerance, that takes compassion, that takes mutual respect, um, and acknowledging that not everybody is coming from the same place, um, not everybody has the same priorities, not everybody has the same resources, not everybody has the same perspectives, everybody has their own history. Um, and if we, can, if we can be more compassionate, if we can show more tolerance, um, we can move forward together more effectively. We can, we can, where there is overlap, where there is shared interests and commonalities, we can drive more change. And so often that, that change is, is, is so powerful. It makes such a difference. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I do just want to give you a sense of some of the things that we're working on besides that um, poaching issue in Massachusetts. So some of the other bills that are pending in Massachusetts that are top priorities for HSUS, and by the way, I know Mike mentioned that MSPCA has an advocacy department. There is tremendous overlap. Um, I work very closely with the advocacy staff, staff at the MSPCA. We spend tons of time together at the Massachusetts State House. So a lot of these priorities are shared between our two organizations um, in terms of state legislation in Massachusetts. So one, of course, is that poaching bill that I mentioned, but we're also working together to, um, to restrict trafficking in elephant ivory and rhino horn in Massachusetts. We have one of the largest markets in the United States, unfortunately, and the United States has the second largest market in the world. So uh, curbing the trade in um, ivory and rhino horn in Massachusetts can make a really big difference in preventing the and ending the, the global pro poaching crisis. We don't want to be contributing to it, and right now, um, because um, our laws do not mirror the federal um, regulations regarding ivory and rhino horn, um, we, we have a market that is contributing to this global poaching crisis. So ivory is another thing we're working on. We're also working on um, circus animal abuse, so um, pr protecting elephants um, and other animals from circus abuse. Unfortunately, those animals are often chained for more than 20 hours a day. Um, the training techniques are really um, horrific. And so we, we need to make a change here in Massachusetts. There are still circuses and traveling shows that are touring through our state. Uh, another issue that we're working on is one that has to do with citations for domestic animals. And so this actually goes um, a little bit beyond what um, the tethering bill that was mentioned. It was a combina combination bill, an omnibus bill. It addressed pets in hot cars, or all animals in hot cars, um, restricted the use of tethering for dogs, and then also enhanced um, citation authority for law enforcement for dogs. So we want to extend that citation authority to other domestic animals. Animals. And that's really important because right now, for animals except for dogs, law enforcement has the ability to either issue a verbal warning or bring felony cruelty charges. And somebody had brought up how, um, you know, we need to... Um, be compassionate and understand uh, that not everybody has the same expectations. Not everybody was raised to see animals the same way. Some people have only seen animals treated a certain way, and so they don't know any different. And um, you know, there's a there 
there's often a distinction between neglect and cruelty, right, in practice. But under the law, um, our law enforcement officers can either bring verbal, uh, they either can have a verbal warning or bring felony cruelty charges. And that doesn't really give you a lot of middle ground. What if something doesn't rise to the level of felony cruelty? What if you don't want to make someone a felon for what they've done? What if it's, it doesn't rise to that level? Sometimes it, it may. But what if it doesn't? What are your options? How do you start driving change in, with that individual? So a written citation, a fine, and a written citation um, can help shift someone in the right direction and uh, make clear evidence that there have been attempts to drive change right, with that specific individual. And so that authority is really important in terms of getting that middle ground. And so we want that not only for dogs, but for other domestic animals as well. So that will really empower our law enforcement officers um, and help hold people accountable. Um, we also have two bills that would impact uh, animals used in research, one that would um, facilitate the retirement of dogs and cats at the end of their term in um, use in research or product testing facility, and so that's nicknamed the Beagle Bill, because um, so often those dogs that are used are beagles, um, and so let's get them into loving homes at the end of their term in research if they don't have to be euthanized for the sake of the study. And then also, there's another one that applies to research animals, um, which would uh, require the use of alternatives to animal testing for product testing. So that's specifically things like cosmetics and household cleaners, certain types of chemicals, paint, things of that nature. So it doesn't apply to medical research. Um, but if there are effective alternatives to animal testing that are out there, Let's use those instead. So it just gives you a small sampling of the bills that are pending in Massachusetts. Of course, there are many, many more. Um, and as you get more comfortable using that, um, the website that I directed you guys to and connecting with your legislators, um, you'll have more and more opportunities to weigh in on these and so many more issues. So I am happy to take any questions that folks may have about the legislative process, about HSUS, how we're organized, um, about the, the bills pending in Massachusetts, or anything else that you guys can think of. I didn't bring any handouts, but there is tons of information online, um, and I'll, I want to give everybody um, my contact info so that I can easily direct you. We do have a summary of all the priority bills. Um, so if you want to email me, uh, you can email me at s, as in Stephanie, harris at humanesociety.org, but if that's too hard to remember, you can also just email massachusetts at humanesociety.org, and that comes to me as well. So massachusetts at humanesociety.org comes straight to me. Our website has phenomenal resources on the different campaigns that we have. Um, it's humanesociety.org, and it's a, an incredible resource. Uh, it doesn't have a ton of state-specific information. It's more about the campaigns generally across the country. So if you need anything that's Massachusetts-specific including those pending bills, um, please do email me at massachusetts at humanesociety.org and I can easily get you uh, that info. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so the bill that uh, requires, I think, in Massachusetts that, that, that animals be treated properly in terms of confinement and that we not actually uh, bring in from other states um, animals that, or their products that have been confined. Uh, we passed that legislation and I think it was, a, it, there were other states that, that fought that in court and I think we won the first round, but I didn't know if if that's right for sure, and if, if it's still pending, it's still probably in the court system, is that right? It's actually not. Um, so it, uh, there, were, there were 13 states that were trying to sue uh, Massachusetts and California, which passed a similar law as well, and that is over. They are not allowed to challenge that. Um, so thankfully, uh, we have won um, in that regard. So yes, the, the law that he brings up and that was brought up earlier, um, it's an act to prevent cruelty to farm animals, and it um, prohibits the cruel confinement of animals. So that's breeding pigs, egg-laying hens, and calves raised for veal, as well as phases out the sale of products that come from that cruel confinement. So that's eggs, 
pork, and veal. Um, and it phases them out by 2022, so there's a little bit time of time left in that timeline, um, but it requires that the Attorney General's Office promulgate regulations by 2020. Um, so we're looking to those next, as the next step after that, um, that case in particular. Yeah, and you're correct also that um, in addition to California, following in our footsteps in, in um, 2018 with Prop 12, um, there are other states that are, that are working on the this, this same law as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I should say, of course, I'm sure some of you were very involved in that campaign. We had more than 1,000 active volunteers on it, and the MSPCA kindly hosted us in their, um, their facility in Boston. We were up on the fourth floor with the advocacy team, um, and it was a tremendous grassroots effort. And, it, and speaking of coalition building, I mean, it wouldn't have been possible without the coalition that we had here in Massachusetts, which is really... I mean, I haven't seen it replicated in, on animal protection issues in any other state. It is truly incredible the way groups in Massachusetts, as well as national groups, came together. And it wasn't just animal groups. It also included farmers. Um, it included retailers, restaurants. It was such a big set of stakeholders that were involved in driving that forward and such a massive volunteer effort. We were the only ballot initiative in 2016 to qualify for the ballot um, without hiring a, a signature gathering firm. So the ballot initiative process, just to back up for a second for anybody who doesn't know, is um, it basically provides a workaround to the state legislature. If the state legislature is consistently not doing what the citizens clearly want, um, we're lucky in Massachusetts, only about half of the states have this. Um, we have this process, we have this workaround, and we've used it, um, and we've used it on animal protection issues. I mentioned the Wildlife Protection Act back in 1996, um, but then also throughout the 2000s, there were three um, greyhound initiatives, and, and the third one finally made it across the finish line, and so um, we have a very well-trained uh, citizenry in Massachusetts of folks who have been engaged in animal protection ballot initiatives specifically, um, and, and and the combination of the coalition that, that we were able to build here in Massachusetts and the volunteer experience and dedication allowed us to gather those signatures without paying a firm. Um, so we had some, some um, campaign staff, it was a small team, but there were some campaign staff and some organization staff like, you know, like Mike and his colleagues at the MSPCA that would help gather signatures. Um, but we didn't pay a firm, which is m the most common thing to do. And we were the only ones that qualified that way. And I think it really speaks to how much people in Massachusetts really care about this issue and the, the overlap between um, farm animal protections and, and human protections. I mean, better conditions for farm animals means better conditions for farm workers, and that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of. So, and and we, were, we were very proud to have um, the United Farm Workers as a um, part of our coalition in Massachusetts on that campaign. All right, I just want to ask the question that might push the envelope a little bit. It gets okay. to just maybe some of the fundamental social functions of animals. Uh, so I'm looking at just issues such as SeaWorld or uh, situations where, you know, just the function that animals play in our society. Uh, do you feel like we're having any cultural or social mm. shifts in terms of how we look at the relationship between animals and human beings, because it looks like that, uh, just to speak sociologically, that that fundamental structure of human domination mm -hmm. and animal subjugation still exists. So I just wanna see how does that sort of fit into the, the conversation and if people actually you know, are addressing that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's such an important question that you've raised, and it's such a valuable thing for everybody to be thinking about. And, and um, there are so many ways in which um, it's easy to forget um, that we are taking advantage of animals um, in so many ways, and that our use of animals is consumptive. And to be really cognizant of that is so important. And um, HSUS, we, we work on um, transforming the landscape for animals, and, and we do that recognizing that incremental change is often the way that that has to be done, right? So this 2016 Farm Animal Protection Initiative in Massachusetts, it was the strongest law for animals in the world when it passed. But it, was, it's, it establishes basically cage-free conditions, right? That's 
that's a baby step, right, in the grand scheme of things. Um, Cage-free conditions means that animals have enough space to stand up, lie down, turn around, and extend their limbs. It doesn't mean they necessarily see sunlight. They touch grass. Um, so these are really important things to think about. Um, and I, you had asked if, if this is changing, and I think it absolutely is. I think that there has been a major shift in the way that we perceive animals, um, especially here in Massachusetts, but, but across the country and, and around the world, um, where we're starting to make these connections in a way that we haven't, at least not in recent decades, um, and where we see the impact of our individual choices um, and, and start to make slightly different choices, right? To the adopt, don't shop point, um, you know, people are starting to know that the, the dogs and cats sold in pet stores, the, the, those are from puppy mills and cat mills. Um, people are starting to be more aware of that. Um, when people, uh, people are um, making conscious decisions to do less harm to animals. And even where there isn't perfection, right? This is part about tolerance and meeting people where they are, even where there isn't perfection. Um, let's welcome people into a larger movement and together we can, we can find our way to better and better conditions for animals. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much everybody for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And one of the things I really appreciated about your presentation is you speak so much about compassion. And as I look down here, there are no notes that you had in front of you. Everything that you said didn't necessarily come from here. It came from here. It came from the heart. So we really appreciate that. And so now we have a 10, 15 minute break. It's a good time to get coffee, water back there, use the bathroom, whatever you need to do. Wow, this is great. People are so cooperative. I love it. All right, so we're about to do the second half of our Forum on Tolerance. And this uh, presentation will be done by Lynn Snyerson. So, Journalist Lynn Snyerson has worn many different hats during her career. After graduating from Duke University with degrees in political science and history, she began her career as a sports reporter, covering the NFL for the St. Louis Sun, the Miami News, and the Boston Herald. Later, she began writing and broadcasting about the thoroughbred racing industry covering racing and professional sports for ESPN, WMUR, which I believe is Channel 9, the ABC affiliate in Manchester, Fox Sports, and other national stations. In 1999, she was recruited by Rockingham Park to become their director of communications and marketing. Now, it's at this location that she began working with athlete horses and riders, their owners and caretakers, Lynn truly began her animal activism, organizing the park's first pet food drives during the recession. And the drives raised tens of thousands of pounds of food to benefit the New Hampshire Food Bank. And that enabled many people facing hardships to uh, keep their companion animals at home. So for a number of years, Lynn has been a staff writer for New Hampshire Magazine she has used that position to write about animals and their rescuers, most recently penning a cover feature about the plight of abandoned, neglected, and abused horses and the heroism of their advocates and rescuers. Lynn Snyerson continues to spotlight animal rights and advocacy through her writing and her media work and via supporting political candidates who recognize that animal rights are human rights. On a personal note, Lynn has been a mom and a rescuer to a number of different rescue dogs, most recently Maeve the Sheltie. And one thing I will say is, on here it doesn't exactly say this, it says a number of exceptionally good looking rescue dogs. So, so that's important to say. 
So I'd like to welcome to the podium, Lynn Snyerson. Thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I, one of my favorite quotes is from a philosopher named Anatoly Franz. And, and the quote is that until one has loved an animal, one's soul remains unawakened. And I do firmly believe that. And um, I think that for, we're all here because we all care about animals and their welfare and their rights. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about horses today because, as we know, that's my expertise. Before I went to Rockingham Park, uh, 95, I believe, um, I was the director of communications at uh, the big racetrack in Chicago, which is Arlington Park. And uh, so I've been around the horses uh, first as a writer and uh, then a racetrack executive and now as a writer again for a really long time. And here we are about eight or nine days away from the Kentucky Derby. And everybody knows the Derby. And everybody thinks of horse racing. You think the mint juleps and the beautiful ladies and the fancy dresses with the big hats and the gorgeous horses and how exciting and thrilling and how the sport of kings it is. Well, yeah, it's that way on the first Saturday in May. But it's not that way a lot of other days of the year. And it's certainly not that way at a lot of other racetracks around the country. Um, in the racing industry, we've, we've had an epiphany uh, about the horses and their welfare. And for the longest time, people in, in the industry, I will say and elsewhere, really considered the horses to be, uh, and I hate to say this, but the word was disposable. After their racing careers were over, and if they were not excellent performers in the breeding shed, they didn't have a commercial value to people in the industry. And then somebody said, this is really wrong. And, and one of the precipitating factors was that a former Kentucky Derby winner named Ferdinand ended up in a slaughterhouse in Japan, which is the fate worse than death until it is the fate of death. And that, that woke people up. Um, because everybody had made money off Ferdinand and off every other horse that had been discarded, whether it was the owner, the breeder, the trainer, the jockey, um, people, uh, people of, like us who wrote about horses, people like me who was a racetrack executive, um, and even the betters who made money off these horses. And all of a sudden somebody got together and people really had this realization that we owe these noble equine athletes who have given their all for us, we need to take care of them. And they can do a whole lot more than just run around a racetrack. That a horse has a, an almost not an infinite number of other things they can do, but they certainly have a multitude of things they can do. Horses are, can be retrained rehabilitated and rehomed off the racetrack into be having very vital and very important and very productive second careers. And a lot of these careers, they, there are, uh, they become therapeutic riding horses. Uh, certainly equine therapy does, makes remarkable results with um, all kinds of people and all kinds of therapy, uh, including PS PTSD for returning more veterans. Um, they are riding horses. They, be, they become hunters and jumpers and dressage horses and show horses. And you see a lot of former race horses, thoroughbreds, competing on Olympic uh, equestrian teams and, and earning bronze, silver, and gold medals. Um, they do a variety of, of jobs. Um, they also become just trail horses and riding horses and police horses. And a lot of them just end up now, um, because people love them, as, as just a paddock pet. A lot of the horses who aren't really capable of even being a trail riding horse uh, because they've been so broken down physically, um, people, some people just want to take care of them and will love them and will um, just say, I'm committed to this horse and you know, maybe I'll just ride her around uh, the ring here at the barn. So uh, there has been a whole brand new, oh wow, excuse me, brand new realization of 
we can do so much more for these horses who have done so much for us and given us so much of enjoyment. Um, there is now, has been formed in 2012, an alliance was formed, it's called the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, and it deals exclusively with the aftercare, uh, retraining, rehoming, rehabilitation of, of racehorses, and uh, they have, they're funded industry-wide, because I said the industry has come together, um, excuse me, I'll just pick up my glass. Um, it's come together industry-wide to make sure that we're taking care of these horses. And I will um, check my notes for, for a moment. And uh, since its inception in 2012, almost 8,000 former racehorses have found a new home or a new career through a TAA-accredited organization. And uh, these industry stakeholders that are now funding this, each one of them has touched a point in the thoroughbred's life, whether it was the breeder, as I say, the owner, the trainer, the jockey, the racetrack executive, whomever. There's also the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, um, which pre predated the TAA, and the TRF has magnificent programs. And uh, one of the programs that they have um, around the country, including right here in Massachusetts that they're affiliated with, is a prison inmate rehabilitation program. And many of the horses who did race at Suffolk Downs right down the road um, are now at the Plymouth County, uh, Plymouth County Sheriff's Farm. I believe that's the correct name of it. And uh, some of these horses uh, were, when they were, uh, for lack of a better word, rescued off the racetrack. Um, they were too broken down to ever go on to have a second career as a police horse or, or a riding horse. And those horses will stay there for the rest of their lives. Other horses who are capable, physically capable, um, many of them have been adopted out to people who will give them a second career and a home for life. And uh, I went down and did a story on the, uh, on the farm and with the TRF, oh, several years ago. And not only did I meet a lot of these former horses who I've written stories about over the years when they raced at Suffolk, but I met the inmates who work with the horse, the horses. And the, the human bond, uh, animal bond that develops is truly remarkable. And um, I found that there was a, a compassion, a kindness, a gentleness with people who were criminals and people who were not so nice to other human beings that ended them up in jail, um, but they are, were so tender-hearted and so loving to the horses who were entrusted to their care. Now, each of these inmates has to qualify to be able to work with the horses on the farm, but I did speak with um, the, the captain who, who runs the program, and um, he said that um, the, the success stories of not just the rehabilitation of the horse, but the rehabilitation of the inmates um, is phenomenal, which is why they want to keep this program going. And he said, these are people who never felt love before in their lives. They never felt that they could trust another human being. They never felt that they could be vulnerable to anyone before. But they love the horse they trust the horse, and they're vulnerable with the horse. And they said sometimes they found an inmate who will have a major breakthrough because after he's established trust with the horse, he'll go in the stall and just sit down in the stall with this 1,200-pound horse that could kill you. I mean, when if a horse kicks you in the sternum or kicks you in the head or, and, or bites you, I mean, these are not good things. And there's such a level of trust that they will go and sit in the stall, go up or just hug the horse, and the human, for the first time in, in his life, will open up and talk to the horse and allow himself to have a point of complete vulnerability. And they said it's just changed these people's lives. And I did talk with a bunch of the inmates, and they told me their stories. And, and some of them said that when they were released from prison, um, one of the men told me he'd already spoken to his wife about it, that... He wanted to adopt this horse that he whom, that he'd been caring for, for for this time at the farm, and it's really you know quite a lovely story and quite a beautiful story, and um, there are these prison programs um, around the country with the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, and there's also the um, the War Horse Project, which is in Saratoga, New York, 
And these are um, veterans who have, combat veterans who have been very wounded and very damaged in war, physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, PTSD, et cetera, very bad um, physical um, problems and, and effects of combat as well. And again, it's the same thing, that they established the bond. The horses are former racehorses who may had their problems on the track too and didn't go on to a fancy farm in Kentucky to become the breeder of another Kentucky Derby horse. These are horses who were damaged, broken down themselves on the racetrack. And again, it's that the humans are bringing the horses back to life. They're, for lack of a better word, reinvigorating them, resurrecting their spirits, their souls. And you're seeing it when the horse and the human bonds, it, it goes both ways. And it's a magnificent and really beautiful thing. So the bad news was that until recently, a lot of people in this industry saw these horses as merely a commodity, a money maker, um, something to cheer for, to root on, to bet on, to um, you're gonna win a purse for me or you're gonna make a horse that I can sell at auction. And once I, this horse leaves my farm and is sold in the auction ring and goes off with somebody else, well, that's somebody else's problem. Um, now, that's not the case. It's, there are funds established through the TAA, TRF, and uh, through the Jockey Club where a part of the purse is going to a retirement program, a 401k, if you will, for the horse. Uh, racetrack executives, racetrack owners are realizing that without the racehorse, we can't put on the show. And we're not going to be taking home profits and salaries and funding our 401ks without these horses. So everybody in the industry is coming together. Um, a lot of the, you'll see a lot of the betters now who've cashed a huge ticket on a horse or won a big handicapping contest for millions, millions of dollars, they are now giving back to support racehorse retirement. Or a couple of, there are a couple of guys who've won these big national handicapping contests with a million dollar prize, and they themselves have adopted an off the track thoroughbred. They have personally provided a home on a farm for a horse because they, people are realizing we owe an enormous debt to these animals who have given so much. And um, if you don't know a lot about a racehorse, I will tell you that they are the most magnificent, beautiful, amazing creatures ever put on this earth. And my dog, please forgive me for saying this, but not only are they so, as a thoroughbred horse, so physically beautiful, but they, they are highly intelligent. They are very high spirited, they are hot bloods, um, but they are, just courageous and brave and they will they love to run and they love to compete and when they are in a race they will dig down to the deepest part of their soul and they will give you their heart and they will give you every ounce of physical energy that that they have to win that race for you and they will literally lay down their lives on a racetrack I mean racetrack fatalities is something is a whole other issue that I'm not going to get into today they will literally lay their life down for you so fortunately thankfully um, wonderfully the industry is now saying that it's time to give back and that's what we're doing so how can you help um, you can, if you are so inclined, you can go on um, Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, TAA.org. You can go to Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, TRF.org. Uh, learn a little bit or a lot more about this. Um, any kind of donation is welcome. Um, people are always looking for volunteers who would love to come and, and help. Um, one of the things I did not mention, uh, I apologize for that, was a lot of these horses become part of mounted police units. And uh, the only way that these can afford to exist is with donations and volunteers. So if you um, are so inclined and you see an officer out there keeping the, keeping the peace on a, uh, on a beautiful horse, um, they would be more than happy to have a bag of carrots dropped off for them. Uh, but there are a lot of ways to, ways to just to get involved. Um, so 
yay for the uh, thoroughbred racing industry and yay for wonderful, compassionate people who are adopting horses and giving them not only a second career and a second home, but a second chance at life. Thank you. Is there, are, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I, I have a question. Okay. Ah. So versus the racing career, because we know that with regular athletes, depending on if you're not Tom Brady, right? Right. From five to ten years as a professional athlete, how about those professional athletes compared to the lifespan? Okay. Um, a thoroughbred racehorse can live to be 35 years old. Thirties. Yeah. They typically some of them will start racing at two. If they're not quite physically or emotionally or mentally ready, it will be three. Like all the horses who are in the, will be in the Kentucky Derby and chasing the Triple Crown are it's restricted to three-year-old horses. Um, some of them, they're off the track at three. Uh, maybe four, you might see them back. Um, sometimes you'll see them racing at five. If a, um, a female horse, a mare, um, you usually don't see them racing much beyond six, uh, if that far, because they have biological clocks that are ticking too, and a lot of them just will say, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. I want to be a mommy. And uh, then they'll go on to their second career and very happily will be broodmares, and they love their foals. Um, a male horse who is gelded, we call them geldings, that is a castrated horse, um, they, they will race longer. You'll see some on the track, eight, nine. Um, Twelve is the last year that a horse is able to race. We do not allow horses to race beyond that. Very rare to see a horse that old. Um, even nine is, is getting up there. So you have these horses that are coming, coming off the track. Maybe some of them just don't ever want to, I don't want to be a horse. I don't like it. I don't like racing. They never even make it to the track. So you're talking about relatively young horses. So their career is over uh, two, three, four, five, and then they're going to live to 35. So we've got 30 years here. And um, one of the things that um, was extremely apparent in this article that I recently wrote for New Hampshire Magazine on the epidemic problem of horse abuse in the state of New Hampshire that is growing, and trust me, it is epidemic that horses are being abused, neglected, starved, abandoned, uh, and part of the problem is, is that when people say, oh, let's get a horse, it'll really be fun, they have no idea what they don't know. They don't know how expensive it is to maintain a horse. They don't understand uh, how labor intensive it is to care for a horse 365 days a year. These are big animals. And when you have big animals, that means big care, big expense, and big problem when you are not up to the task. So yes, there are people who are committing animal cruelty. And yes, there are people who don't think that an animal has a soul or an animal deserves food or shelter or fresh, clean water. Um, but most of the people, they just get in over their heads because they don't know what they don't know. And it's very easy, especially when the mercury starts to fall and the winter's coming and the ground freezes so the horses can't graze naturally on the grass and they don't have access to fresh water because it's frozen. You get in over your head awfully fast when you are not capable of meeting the responsibilities of caring for an equine and you get underwater really, really fast. And that's why we have an epidemic of horse abuse in New Hampshire. And I don't think that New Hampshire is the only one of 50 states where this is happening. This is an epidemic problem. So um, yeah, if you want to, people want to rescue a horse, that's great. And we welcome it, and we think it's fabulous. But please be you know, financially and physically and responsible and able in every way. And the good thing about the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance and the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation is in their 
um, accredited facilities across the country, they check. They check very carefully to make sure that these farms and rescue facilities are legitimate and they continually check and they have to meet accreditation standards because we don't want to have to be rescuing horses from a so-called rescue farm. And in New Hampshire, that's going on right now is we have fraud rescues. These are people who will just go on Facebook and say, oh, I'm, you know, the wonderful rescue horse lady, and it's happening all over the country. So, hey, give me all these donations so I can pull all these horses in here and pull them out of the um, auction and the bad places that horses get discarded to and just keep sending me money because I'm going to be taking great care of all these horses and look how wonderful it is. And a lot of these places are frauds or again people who are not qualified and able to provide proper care and there's an awful lot of instances that we have now that we have to go in and rescue from an, an, a, a rescuer. So yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a life long commitment and it's really expensive and um, if you've, you've got to carry this through and if you have a horse, you own a horse. Um, I was just recently found out from research of this article. If you have a farm and if you're allowed to bury your horse on the farm, it's still a minimum of $500 in New Hampshire. Cremation for, thor for, for a horse is over $2,000. That's, that's you know, that's just one part of it, and that's at the end of years of what you're going to have to pay. So, yeah, it's an expensive proposition, and it's a lifelong commitment. And thank you. That was a great question. Yes, ma'am. I've got a question. My first question is, um, for the organizations, you, the organizations you were talking about both mentioned purebred or thoroughbred, did they take in other racehorses that are not considered... <laughs> Purebred or thoroughbred? Okay. These are thoroughbred exclusive organizations. There okay. is... So if I went to my local racetrack, which we don't, I think, have any in Mass, right? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. If I went to my local racetrack, like, would all of those horses be purebred, thoroughbred? No, not if, necessarily. If you go to Suffolk Downs, yes, they would all be thoroughbred horses. Okay. If you went to Plain Ridge Park, Plain Ridge Park Casino... Yep. And they're all standard breads. Those are harness horses. So those horses don't qualify as part. No, okay. they don't. But the good news is that the standard bread industry has recently recognized that there is a similar problem in that they've got too. And so they are starting a um, standard bread aftercare alliance type In of program that's vein. modeled on the thoroughbred aftercare alliance and I'm happy to tell you that I know it's going to be a great success because a friend of mine who um, is a life was born into the harness racing industry her, her parents were trainers and her brother's a trainer and um, she worked in the industry as its director of communications for many, many years. And um, she is going to, she is spearheading this organization. She's starting it and pulling it all together and setting it up. And she's enormously gifted and extremely bright. Boston College graduate, by the way. And uh, she, so I know if El, my friend Ellen Harvey is running this, they're going to be very, they're going to save a lot of standard bred horses too. Okay, because I just didn't want to see, it seems like, you know, we're talking about the, the cream of the crop horses, and it's like, well, what about all the other horses? Um, and then my second question for you was in regards to using these horses in prison programs. Now, I think that's absolutely fantastic to use them as therapy horses, but then again, my question runs into, you know, a gentleman freshly leaving incarceration loves this horse, is that man really going to be able to realistically take that horse home and care for it? And is there any kind of oversight into that? Oh, yes, there's absolute oversight. And this is a, um, the, the captain of um, the, I'm sorry, I, he was captain somebody, he's with the sheriff's department in, in um, Massachusetts. But he explained that, yes, this is a privilege. And these people have to be, uh, you have to earn it. And um, so it's for inmates who have been there for a while and have demonstrated that they deserve to, to be with us. And they are trained through a groom elite program on how to properly care for the horse. And um, some of the inmates, 
uh, thank you for bringing this up, I neglected to mention, some of the inmates who have been served their time and been released have come to Suffolk Downs and they have gotten gainful employment working for a trainer as a groom back when there were horses stabled at Suffolk for the entire season. So it's been a very successful uh, rehabilitation for them. Yeah, absolutely. I know, I just thought like sending home a, a convict with a horse seems like you're setting them up for failure. Oh, no, no, they have, yeah. to, they have to earn their way into it and they have to be selected to it. And, and the officers at the farm told me that um, a lot of people want, they really want to do this. They want to earn this privilege. So it also helps the prison population, you know, keeps everybody like, I'll be really, I'll be a really good prisoner so I can earn my right to care to be with the, the horses. Right. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. For Thank your you very much. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, a lot of our thoroughbreds do go on to therapeutic riding programs. Uh huh. And um, it's for all, all kinds of equine therapy. And um, I believe it was Hippocrates. Andrea, help me out. What year, Hippocrates, BC? <laughs> okay, everybody, who's, anybody that's far from, if you want to Google it, you can look up the year Hippocrates said that. Hippocrates, um, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, was using equine therapy as a healing technique in Greece in all those centuries BC. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, at the dawn, the dawn of medicine uh, did recognize the value of equine therapy, and so a lot of thor thoroughbreds, um, yes, all over are being used, um, and again, it's marvelous. It's absolutely marvelous, the, the work that they do, and, and the bond that is established between the rider and the horse um, is, is time and time and time again. Anybody you talk to who's involved with equine therapy, anything you read about it, anything you'll watch about it, they just say that um, the results are remarkable. And again, it's that human-animal bond that is very special in and of itself. He died in 370 BC. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yay, yay for smart. Yay for, yay for Google, right? Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I certainly hope so. Yeah, we hope so. Um, back in the 1950s, the three most popular sports in this country were boxing, baseball, and thoroughbred horse racing. And we can see that boxing has been supplanted by MMA, which has actually come up, it's coming, it hit the peak, and even MMA is coming down. You know, baseball, not as popular as, as NFL or even NBA. Um, around these days. So things change and uh, obviously times change. And the point is that the industry is recognizing that it has to change. And um, so there are, I do see the, I do see the industry carrying on, um, but the way that they're reaching, reaching out now to younger people and getting more people involved is with, with the smartphones, with the tablets, with the mobile devices, that now you don't have to physically go to a racetrack and sit there and walk up to a betting window, put your $2 through. Um, only, um, I think about the last statistic I heard, and it was a few years ago, said that 91 cents of every dollar wagered on horse racing in this country now is wagered off track through Smartphones, laptops, lap, um, tablets, um, and uh, phone betting. So now with the advent of sports betting, which has come to states around the country, um, I don't think it's coming to Massachusetts. I just read the legislature is not actually all that gung-ho on it this year. Uh, New Hampshire, it looks like, is going to be passing sports betting. So with sports books and um, legalized sports betting coming, the industry is really hoping to piggyback on that. And maybe when a young person is sitting in a sports book um, on a, say, Wednesday afternoon and can't bet an NFL game 
or bet a um, March Madness basketball game might say, hey, let's take a look at this horse racing stuff. So with the advent of technology and how people's tastes are changing now in the 21st century, horse racing is trying to adapt to capitalize and, and go into a new direction and not just to lie on somebody to show up at the track with a printed racing form in your hand and sit there and bet, and bet your race. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for your time. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I appreciate being invited. So in a moment, I'll introduce one of our students who's going to introduce our last speaker. But first, I wanted to say a few words about Dave Hole. Dave Hole is our longest former Montaller member, other than Sully. He is retiring, unfortunately, in the next week. He's been part of the forums on tolerance since they were incepted in 1994. They originally grew out of Holocaust studies. Dave's been um, very involved, doing a lot of things having to do with religious tolerance, and particularly religious tolerance in the LGBTQ community. Um, he's very involved in all of diversity at North Shore Community College, not just the forums on tolerance, but NCBI um, and Diversity Leadership Council. We're all going to really miss him. I kind of don't know what I'm going to do with Adam, but I would like to just give him a little gift on behalf of the Forum on Tolerance Committee. Just quickly, thank you so much. I'm very touched. And so we do have a student here from the Environmental Club who wanted to be involved um, and is going to introduce our last speaker of the day. So let me introduce you to Kobe Weiss, who's going to say a few words about our last speaker. Thank you, thank you. So our final speaker, Diane Sullivan, is an assistant dean of students at the profe and professor of law at the Massachusetts School of Law. She teaches uniform commercial code, contracts issues impacting women and animal law. In addition, Dean Sullivan serves as moderator and producer of MS Law's educational forum television series. Dean Sullivan received her BA, magnum cum laude, from Fitchburg State College and her JD, magnum cum laude, as well, from Massachusetts School of Law. She has been a vice president and, of, and counsel for a large financial institution in Worcester, Massachusetts, and is now an avid animal rights activist. Dean Sullivan taught at Massachusetts School of Law and as an adjunct faculty member before joining the full-time faculty. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Diane Sullivan. Top of the morning. I'm Diane Sullivan, and I've been asked to do two things here today, to give you the legal landscape as it pertains to animals, and to talk a little bit about the human-animal connection. So I intend to talk about the legality of animals for about 15 minutes, and then a couple of minutes we'll talk about the human-animal bond, and then I would welcome your questions. I have been teaching animal law for nearly 30 years. One pervasive theme that resonates through my course is American society's convenient classification of animals as property, oftentimes expressed in existing law as the equivalent of a piece of merchandise, and a low price one at that. This legal treatment inevitably leads to the most basic question of all. How can a society that is as great as our society treat any life, not to mention women's best friend, as the equivalent of a low-priced 
piece of furniture, your watch, or your latest iPod. Our animal law textbooks are replete with decision after decision that make too clear that the law does nothing or virtually nothing to protect the animals or to respect the role they play in our families and in our lives today. Now, one caveat, it would be very easy for me to give in to the distinction between companion animals like our dogs and cats and other animals like a chimpanzee. But to do so would ignore the fact that all animals are capable of experiencing great pain. And most particularly, I want to point out that chimpanzees share our genetic makeup. They are virtually identical in terms of their genetic makeup to you and I. So to suggest that a dog and cat who share our homes have value and a chimpanzee does not would trigger an absurd conclusion and one I'm not going to make here this morning. Animals all experience sadness, grief, and several other emotions. And now we know their genetic makeup, in many cases, is very much like ours. So shouldn't they at least have rights that are equal to those qualities? I suggest, or I posit, that the answer is yes. So as wrong as it is, the animals are considered property in the eyes of the law, despite the fact that they do feel pain, display emotion, exhibit loyalty and sadness, and share our genetic makeup in many cases. Based on our common knowledge of animals, the need to eliminate animals as property is, in my assessment, the crucial requirement to advance rights of animals. Most of us remember the historically embarrassing case of Dred Scott, in which the court discusses that black African slaves were the equivalent of merchandise, low-priced merchandise. Whenever a profit could be made, we considered black slaves to be property. Now, that was interesting because at that time we were still punishing property for crimes. So how do you punish property? But it was clearly done for the benefit of the slave owner. Similarly, women were considered the property of their husbands and had no rights at all. They couldn't inherit property. I teach contract law. They couldn't enter into contracts. And rights of children, well, like wives, they were the property of dad. And that has changed not enough in my assessment because we still run roughshod over the rights of kids because we have this notion that parental rights trump everything. There's resistance from commercial interests, and you all know that, to brand animals as chattel. It's convenient, it's profitable, and <laughs> let's face it, the fact that animals are property is being done for economic interests. So I make the argument that like the African slave, like the woman and like the child, animals deserve a non-property classification they are sentient creatures, which means they are capable of experiencing pain, and they should be treated as something that's not a piece of property. Approximately 20 cities, and admittedly I haven't checked recently, and one entire state, the state of Rhode Island, have legally, with laws, changed the classification of, quote, owners of animals. You don't own your property, you're now the guardian of your property. It's a mindset change, um, really not a lot more than that. Perhaps the most limiting example of the property classification of animals is the lack of recovery when somebody intentionally or negligently kills or harms your pet. You don't recover what we know in the law as emotional distress damages. So if your Yorkshire Terrier is hit by a car that's speeding down the road and blows through a red light, you don't recover anything. The market value, $20. Uh, no consequential type damages. You know, and think about whether you think that's fair or whether that has to be, has to be changed. 
in light of the fact that 75% of owners or guardians consider their pet to be a family member, is it appropriate to still say that, that no recovery should be permitted? Shirley S. Abramson, who was the former Chief Justice of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, in an opinion known as Rabideau versus the city of Rass Racine said, this type of a decision belongs with each state legislature. Let them enact the laws. It doesn't belong in court. Having appeared before her progressive court personally, of great respect for her, but that's not right. Okay, we have states. We have California. We have Ohio. We have a number of states who have, either by judicial decision or statutory enactment, have now put in laws that say you can recover X amount of dollars for the negligent or the intentional harm caused to your pet. Massachusetts lacks that type of legislation or judicial decision. Tennessee was the first state in the nation that allowed recovery, and the initial amount was $4,500 with a number of exceptions. But here in Massachusetts, we still do not permit that type of recovery. One of the best examples, I think, of the wrongness of the property classification of the animals I want to tell you about, it has to do with um, American Airlines. Actually, the case was Gluckman versus American Airlines. If your airline loses your suitcase, and it has your shoes and your suit and another, a number of personal items in it, you will recover a maximum of $1,250. That's what you recover for lost or damaged luggage. If they kill your pet with excessive heat and a whole number of other situations based on negligence or intent, you know how much you recover? $1,250. Your pet is the same as your shoes and your suit in the eyes of the law. That is problematic, that needs to change. Now that's the bad news. Let me tell you the good news. One of my animal law students is a, or was um, a airline, commercial airline pilot for American Airlines. And he tells me that following that decision, the airlines have made significant changes and they do better. Even though the legal liability isn't there, they recognize they have to do better and it's much safer today to travel with your pet. In fact, his dog regularly accompanies him, you know, awaiting the next adventure. So that's good news. Sometimes things can happen that benefit animals even without uh, legal imposition, if you will. Some courts still remain slow to provide recovery, as I have said, for negligent or intentional uh, acts that cause harm to animals. Some defendants recognize, at least I think they do, the role that animals play in people's life. Turn back the clock here in Massachusetts to the streets of Boston about 10 years ago when a number of dogs were electrocuted on the sidewalk. And Star came forward, and they paid much more than the market value or the $20 street value of a dog. Now, did they do that because they didn't want negative publicity? Or did they do that because they recognized the special role that animals play in people's lives and people were distraught? I don't have the answer. But in any case, they paid far more than the street value or the $20 that people um, typically receive when, when their pet is killed. Because the animals lack a property, well, well, because they have a property classification, let's go with that. If you see an animal in a zoo, you see, hear of an animal in a lab, you can't do anything to help that animal because you don't have standing. Okay, so know that. As a law professor that specializes in this field, I think the most horrific example in America with respect to the treatment of animals and the lack of rights is the animal sacrifice cases. If Gandhi was correct when he said, you judge the moral progress of a nation by the way its animals are treated, I have to say the United States has a ways to go. In 1957, the European Economic Community 
signed the Treaty of Rome. It did not include animal protocols. About 40 years later, the Treaty of Amsterdam was enacted, which does have significant animal protocols. They ban veal crates. Um, they do a number of things better than we do here in America. In Israel, they don't even force feed animals, birds. We still do that. You know, fine restaurants in Boston. Seems to me to be pretty outrageous, but in any event, I guess I don't have the tolerance quite down yet. You know, I try, but I don't. Um, so, animal sacrifice cases. In the United States, we don't be an animal sacrifice done in the name of religion. I think that has to change. For many years, I've told my students that societal attitudes are changing. Things are getting better. A brighter day is coming. I'm not sure that's accurate. We've made stride. Victims of domestic violence often won't leave their homes. Women won't leave, and it's not limited to women, but it's principally women, won't leave a batterer because they, they are afraid to leave the family pet. And there's been nowhere they could really go with the pet. Well, still a minority, but there are, are networks now that will assist with care of the pet. That's good news. Cat, pets now can be protected by a restraining order. Likewise, good news. Too often, we see, we read, we hear about people teasing or torturing animals for their own amusement. We need to vigorously prosecute those who do. Massachusetts, you've heard today, it's a felony punishable up to seven years for acts of cruelty. That's the good news. The bad news is a lot of judges and DAs don't take it as seriously as they ought to. I think that will change in time. Michael Vick's incident brought to the forefront dog fighting. And the swift penalties, the public outrage, I think changed our reaction in America to those who engage in that type of activity. Pets are property. They're important parts of families. People are entering now into custody disputes. I never thought I'd see the day over the family pet. People spend all kinds of money over, you know, I live alone with my, with my dogs, but, you know, people will spend everything they have to get the family pet. Here's the problem. If they're property, there's no best interest of the pet standard in Massachusetts. What there is is who has title, whose property is it? That's who gets the pet. Alaska recently changed the law there, so they have adopted the best interest of the pet standard. I don't know what will happen in the rest of the country over the years. So the issue of custody and visitation is becoming one that's important to people. Likewise, turning back the clock not that long ago, it was very hard to be able to provide for your pet in a will or trust because, again, of the property limitation. Today, every state in the United States has a law to enable people to provide for their pets by a will or a trust or some mechanism. Like most jurisdictions in Massachusetts, it's a felony to willfully permit torture, torment to animals. Problem is, animals in labs. Labs are exempted, so they, they are not subject to cruelty laws. Animal Welfare Act was enacted to regulate animals that are being used in labs. Understand what I'm going to say now is my opinion. It's a very weak law. I think it was enacted to silence public outrage over what's going on for practices in laboratories in the Commonwealth. With the advancement of science and technology to which I don't know a lot about, I only know what I read. I think there's enough other viable ways by growing human cells in test tubes, um, by doing computer modeling, um, that I don't think we need to be subjecting animals to, to torture within a lab. I, I, I don't broadcast this. I will tell you I'm critically ill with a rare disease, and I still feel that way. There is nothing that, to me that could justify using an animal to, to do research on to help me. I just, 
I, I, I don't accept that, that that's okay. So in conclusion, legal rights for animals are worrisome because we utilize animals for our own pleasure, profit, economic pursuit, and entertainment. With the recognition that animals are sentient creatures capable of experiencing great pain, should come a realization that animals are not property, they are not innate objects, and our legal system needs to recognize this. It did when slaves, women, and children were considered property. It's time to do this for animals. There's a high correlation between abuse of animals and human abuse and property uh, type crimes. MSPCA has conducted studies on this. Finally, circuses are on their way out. I'll disagree with my friend Lynn here and say I think greyhound racing and horse racing are on their way out and I see that as a very good thing. I could live with horse racing if we didn't use a whip, we didn't have forced entry into the gate, and we didn't use steroids. The number of deaths on small tracks is unacceptable to me, but yet I applaud the efforts of, of what Lynn's group is doing. We now, you heard earlier today, in Massachusetts have tethering restrictions. You no longer get a dog and chain it outside 24-7. Search warrants may not be necessary, to rescue an animal that's in distress. If an MSPCA officer or other officer suspect that, the appeals court in Massachusetts, in a landmark decision, awarded damages in terms of veterinary um, costs, very large veterinary bill. That was a great sign. And finally, we now have a prescribed procedure in which we can break into a car in which a pet is in distress because of excessive heat or cold. Um, so these are all good signs. So things are not stagnant, they're improving. I'm not a patient person, as you can probably tell. I, I want everything to be okay for everybody, people and kids, tomorrow. All right, so now, the last thing I want to do for you. In addition to my teaching duties, the law school, we have a charity known as the Shadow Fund that helps people whose pets are going to be euthanized because they don't have money um, for a medical treatment. We get calls, 20 sometimes on a Monday. We can't help everyone. We're a tiny, tiny, tiny charity. Um, but we get calls from mostly elderly, disabled people whose pet needs something. And so we try to help where we can. So how do we raise the money to do this? It's not easy, as you can imagine. We're a law school, um, but we have this charity. So one of the things I've done is I have books in which all of the profits go to the Shadow Fund. This is a collection of 49 rescue students by Massachusetts School of Law students all of the proceeds, when we put it together, have funded the Shadow Fund for years. I have done two more. Life's Not Always a Day at the Beach, which is my memoir. All the proceeds go. But this book, it's called, take a look at the picture. I rescued two dogs, now who will rescue me? It is intended to be a comedy of my latest two dog rescue. My dog's four and a half now. I'm going to address the human connection by reading you one paragraph from my book. Courtesy of my monsters, I have laughed, I have cried, I have seen my house turned upside down. I have been wrapped in their leashes, dragged through the streets, trying to control them. It was only a matter of time before they decide to play keep away with me in the middle. If only they'd use a ball to pass around. On this evening, I went out to get them. As I first reach for Sasha, she reaches for the tie on my wraparound skirt and within a second has pulled my skirt off and goes running through the yard with it. Apollo quickly follows and has the other side. So there I stand in utter disbelief in my yard in nothing but my slip. Fortunately, it's dark out, so no, so no one, oh please let it be no one, sees me as I run inside. I put on my sweats, I go back outside to retrieve two monster dogs and one mangled skirt. Okay, 
So, how do dogs add to our lives? My dogs are so challenging that I feel that I need to outlive them because I don't know who else is going to put up with these two monsters who I love dearly. I welcome any questions. Nothing? Yes, Lynn. There has been, and the vet, veterinarians have been behind it, which would be mandated reporters to it. It hasn't had enough tra traction to go anywhere. It would be a good thing. But added to the list of so many things we need to do, um, I hope that you know in the next decade that certainly will pass. I think it might, but I don't think it's going to pass this year or next. Good question. Anything else? Yes. There are a number of different um, shelters out of Boston that could provide that type of contact information. There are also some kennels that will temporarily house their dogs, but most of the shelters know, know that information. The other thing that's often important to do, and now you legally can do it, which you couldn't for, you know, in the past, is you should protect, if you're a victim of abuse, and you're going to go get a restraining order, include your pet in the restraining order. The, the, the family pet often becomes a target, either A for control or B for retaliation. That's been my experience. Any other questions? Yes. What rights should they have? What rights should they have? What rights should animals have? I think they should have the right to be free from pain inflicted on them by humans for profit or entertainment. They should have rights commensurate with their ability to feel pain. That's what I believe. I'm not asking for them to have the right to vote. Yes. Oh my goodness, how are you? I have. What else can I help with? Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, for everyone, for coming. I just wanted to announce our fall forum. In the fall, we'll be call, um, collaborating with Salem State with their Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. So we'll be doing something specifically addressing human rights, hate speech, and genocide. So um, look for that in the fall. It'll probably be about October, and it'll be on both campuses. So thank you all for coming so much.